Welcome back, dear friends, to the Crimson Academy's course on the advent of divine justice. Dear friends, we are on part five of exploring the advent of divine justice. And in this section, dear friends, we will be covering paragraphs 12 through 15. In this section, the topics that will be covered is the cradle and stronghold of the New World Order, the Baha'i community of North America, and glory of the Golden Age. So dear friends, let's go through these paragraphs. Paragraph 12. The one chief remaining citadel, the mighty arm, which still raises aloft the standard of an unconquerable faith is none other than the blessed community of the followers of the most great name in the North American continent. By its works and through the unfailing protection vouchsafed to it by an almighty providence this distinguished member of the body of the constantly interacting Baha'i communities of East and West bids fair to be universally regarded as the cradle as well as the stronghold of that future new world order, which is at once the promise and the glory of the dispensation associated with the name of Baha'u'llah. Let anyone inclined to either belittle the unique station conferred upon this community or to question the role it will be called upon to play in the days to come, ponder the implication of these pregnant and highly illuminating words uttered by Abdul Baha and address to it at a time when the fortunes of a world groaning beneath the burden of a devastating war had reached their lowest ebb. The continent of America, he so significantly wrote, is in the eyes of the one true God, the land wherein the splendors of his light shall be revealed where the mysteries of his faith shall be unveiled, where the righteous will abide and the free assemble. Already the community of the believers of the North American continent, at once the prime mover and pattern of the future communities which the faith of Baha'u'llah is destined to raise up throughout the length and breadth of the Western Hemisphere has, despite the prevailing gloom, shown its capacity to be recognized as the torchbearer of that light, the repository of those mysteries, the exponent of that righteousness and the sanctuary of that freedom. To what other light can these above quoted words possibly allude, if not to the light of the glory of the golden age of the faith of Baha'u'llah? What mysteries could Abdul Baha have contemplated except the mysteries of that embryonic world order now evolving within the matrix of his administration? What righteousness, if not the righteousness whose reign that age and that order can alone establish? What freedom but the freedom which the proclamation of his sovereignty in the fullness of time must bestow? The community of the organized promoters of the faith of Baha'u'llah in the American continent the spiritual descendants of the dawnbreakers of an heroic age, who by their death proclaimed the birth of that faith, must, 
in turn usher in not by their death, but through living sacrifice. That promised world order, the shell ordained to enshrine that prince, the priceless jewel, the world civilization of which the faith itself is the sole begetter, while its sister communities are bending beneath the tempestuous winds that beat upon them from every side. This community, preserved by the immutable decrees of the omnipotent ordainer and deriving continual sustenance from the mandate with which the tablets of the divine plan have invested it, is now busily engaged in laying the foundations and in fostering the growth of those institutions which are to herald the approach of the age destined to witness the birth and rise of the world order of Baha'u'llah. Excellent, dear friends. So let's look into an introduction to these paragraphs 12 through 15. The beloved guardian identifies the North American Baha'i community as the remaining fortress upholding the standards of the cause of His Holiness Baha'u'llah in the chaos surrounding the world at that time. He calls that community the cradle and stronghold of a new world order that is the promise and the glory of the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, and cites a statement from His Holiness Abdul Baha to justify this assertion. Now, dear friends, let's look at some major points from these paragraphs. In the Persian Bayan, Bayan Farsi, His Holiness the Bab announces the order that is associated with the revelation of Baha'u'llah. And in the Kitab Ahdas, His Holiness Baha'u'llah makes reference to this order as the new world order. The beloved guardian considers attainment to the new world order as the only savior, humanity in its dire condition. The beloved guardian identifies the evolving Baha'i administrative order as the nucleus and pattern of the new world order. The Baha'i community of North America will play a major role in the unfoldment of the new world order towards its full glory. Also, dear friends, there are two simultaneous but independent and closely linked processes occurring in America towards the realization of the new world order. The first process, dear friends, is associated with the mission of North American Baha'i community, as revealed by His Holiness Abdul Baha in the tablets of the Divine Plan. The second process is associated with the role that the American nation, unaware of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, plays in the establishment of the new world order. The golden age, dear friends, is the stage of perfection and the realization of the goals of the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. So dear friends, those were the major points. So let's get into it. In paragraph 12, dear friends, the beloved guardian, Shor Effendi, refers to the North American Baha'i community as the chief remaining citadel, chief remaining citadel, upholding the standards of the cause of His Holiness Baha'u'llah in the chaos surrounding the world at that time. Shoghi Effendi suggests that it is fair 
considering the works conducted by this community and the protection vouchsafed for it by His Holiness Baha'u'llah to suggest that the North American Baha'i community can be considered as the cradle and stronghold of the new world order. And that is the promise and glory of the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. Interestingly, dear friends, the Blessed Ba announces this order. In the Persian Bayan, the Blessed Ba announces the order that is associated with the revelation of His Holiness Baha'u'llah. And he exhorts, who fixeth his gaze upon the order of Baha'u'llah and rendereth thanks unto his Lord, for he will assuredly be made manifest. God hath indeed irrevocably ordained it in the Bayan. And we find this reference, dear friends, in God Passes By, page 25. And there's a page from the Persian Bayan. In the Kitab Ahdas, His Holiness Baha'u'llah's most holy book, Baha'u'llah makes reference to this order as the new world order and announces the world's equilibrium hath been upset through the vibrating influence of this most great, this new world order. Mankind's ordered life hath been revolutionized through the agency of this unique, this wondrous system, the like of which mortal eyes have never witnessed. And we find that, dear friends, in Baha'u'llah's Kitab Ahdas, page 85. The world's equilibrium hath been upset. The beloved guardian, Shore Effendi, considers the realization of the new world order, whose promise is enshrined in the revelation of Baha'u'llah, whose fundamental principles have been enunciated in the writings of the center of his covenant as the only savior humanity in its dire condition. It is, dear friends, towards this goal the goal of a new world order, divine in origin, all embracing in scope, equitable in principle, and challenging in its features that a harassed community must strive. And we find these references, dear friends, in the beloved guardian's letters, the world order of Baha'u'llah. And you see the references, page 162 and page 34. The beloved guardian identifies the evolving Baha'i administrative order as the nucleus and pattern of the new world order. He affirms that with the expansion and consolidation of the administrative order and as its component parts, its organic institutions begin to function with efficiency and vigor, assert its claim and demonstrate its capacity to be regarded not only as the nucleus, but the very pattern of the new world order. Destined, dear friends, to embrace in the fullness of time the whole of mankind. According to the beloved guardian, Shor Effendi, the structure of the new world order, now stirring in the womb of the administrative institutions, he, His Holiness Baha'u'llah himself, has created, will serve both as a pattern and a nucleus of that world commonwealth, which is the sure, the inevitable destiny of the peoples and nations of the earth. We find this, dear friends, in the beloved guardian's letter, The Promised Day Has Come, written in 1941, 
on page 118. Regarding the impact of the new world order, the beloved guardian Shoghai Fendi asserts that it will achieve no less than the complete unification of the entire human race. This unification should conform to such principles as would directly harmonize with the spirit that animates and the laws that govern the operation of the institutions that already constitute the structural basis of the administrative order of his faith. And this, dear friends, the quote we find in the World Order of Baha'u'llah, page 162. The emergence of the new world order and its consummation will, by its very nature, be a gradual process and must, as Baha'u'llah has himself anticipated, lead at first to the establishment of that lesser peace which the nations of the earth as yet unconscious of his revelation and yet unwittingly enforcing the general principles which he has enunciated will themselves establish. This momentous and historic step involving the reconstruction of mankind as the result of the universal recognition of its oneness and wholeness will bring in the wake the spiritualization of the masses, consequent to the recognition of the character and the acknowledgement of the claims of the faith of Baha'u'llah, the essential condition to that ultimate fusion of all races, all classes, creeds, and nations which must signalize the emergence of his new world order. And we find this, dear friends, in the beloved guardian's letter, The Promised Days Come, page 123. In one of his messages, Shoah Fendi briefly articulates the general character, the implications and features of the world commonwealth representing the new world order. The unity of the human race as envisaged by Baha'u'llah implies the establishment of a world commonwealth in which all nations, races, creeds and classes are closely and permanently united and in which the autonomy of its, in, of its state members and personal freedom and initiative of the individuals that compose them are definitely and completely safeguarded. The unity of the human race as envisaged by His Holiness Baha'u'llah implies the establishment of a world commonwealth in which this commonwealth, dear friends, must, as far as we can visualize it, consist of a world legislator whose members will, as the trustees of the whole of mankind, ultimately control the entire resources of all the component nations and will enact such laws as shall be required to regulate the life, satisfy the needs, and adjust the relationships of all races and peoples. A world executive backed by international force will carry out the decisions arrived at and apply the laws enacted by this world legislature and will safeguard the organic unity of the whole world commonwealth. A world tribunal will educate and deliver its compulsory and final verdict in all 
and any disputes that may arise between the various elements constituting this universal system. A mechanism of world intercommunication will be devised, embracing the whole planet, freed from national hindrances and restrictions, and functioning with marvelous swiftness and perfect regularity. A world metropolis will act as the nerve center of a world civilization, the focus towards which the unifying forces of life will converge and from which its energizing influences will radiate. A world language will either be invented or chosen from among the existing languages and will be taught in the schools of all the federated nations as an auxiliary to their mother tongue. The world script, a world literature, a uniform and universal system of currency of weights and measures will simplify and facilitate intercourse and understanding among the nations and races of mankind. The unity of the human race as envisaged by His Holiness Baha'u'llah implies the establishment of a world commonwealth in which, in such a world society, science and religion, the two most potent forces in human life, will be reconciled, will cooperate, and will harmoniously develop the press will, under such a system, while giving full scope to the expression of the diversified views and convictions of mankind, cease to be mischievously manipulated by vested interests, whether private or public, and will be liberated from the influence of contending governments and peoples. The economic resources of the world will be organized. Its sources of raw materials will be tapped and fully utilized. Its markets will be coordinated and developed and the distribution of its products will be equitably regulated. National rivalries, hatreds, and intrigues will cease, and racial animosity and prejudice will be replaced by racial amity, understanding, and cooperation. The causes of religious strife will be permanently removed. Economic barriers and restrictions will be completely abolished, and the inordinate distinction between classes will be obliterated. Destitution on the one hand and gross accumulation of ownership on the other will disappear. The enormous energy dissipated and wasted on war, whether economic or political, will be consecrated to such ends as will extend the range of human inventions and technical development to the increase of the productivity of mankind, to the extermination of disease, to the extension of scientific research, to the raising of the standard of physical health, to the sharpening and refinement of the human brain, to the exploitation of the unused and unsuspected resources of the planet to the prolongation of the human life and to the furtherance of any other agency that can stimulate the intellectual, the moral, and spiritual life of the entire human race. A world federal system ruling the whole earth 
and exercising unchallengeable authority over its unimaginably vast resources, blending and embodying the ideals of both the East and the West, liberated from the curse of war and its miseries and bent on the exploitation of all the available sources of energy on the surface of the planet, a system in which force is made the servant of justice, whose life is sustained by its universal recognition of one God and by its allegiance to one common revelation. Such is the goal towards which humanity, impelled by the unifying source forces of life, is moving. And we find this, dear friends, in the World Order of Baha'u'llah, pages 203 to 204. And as you see, these bullets were added for emphasis. The beloved guardian, Shoghe Effendi, quotes from the tablets of the divine plan in paragraph 13. To confirm the unique station North American Baha'i community has. In this assertion, His Holiness Abdul Baha describes the continent of America as a land where the splendors of the light of God will be revealed. The mysteries of his faith shall be known, upright people will abide in, and those who are free will gather together. And this is a beautiful picture of the 26th Annual Convention of the Baha'is of the United States and Canada, dated May 1934. In paragraph 14, the beloved guardian Shoghe Effendi explains the meaning and implications of the statement of Abdul Baha quoted in paragraph 13 by pointing out that the light is glory of the golden age of the faith of Baha'u'llah. The mysteries are the characteristics of the new world order evolving within the matrix of the Baha'i administration. The righteousness will be established by the new world order. And freedom, dear friends, will be achieved in the fullness of time through the proclamation of the sovereignty of His Holiness Baha'u'llah. Spiritual Descendants of the Dawnbreakers. The statement of His Holiness Abdul Baha in Shoghe Effendi's interpretation implies that America as a nation and the North American Baha'i community in particular will play major roles in the unfoldment of the new world order in its full glory. Finally, dear friends, in paragraph 15, the beloved guardian Shoghe Effendi identifies the North American Baha'i community as the spiritual descendants of the dawnbreakers of the cause in Persia who proclaim the birth of the revelations of the Bab and Baha'u'llah by their martyrdoms. Similarly, the North American believers must usher in the world order of Baha'u'llah through their living sacrifice, not death, building the institutions that will herald the unfoldment of that order. In Citadel of Faith, written in 1947, the beloved guardian Shoghe Effendi shed some light on the processes associated with America that would eventually lead to the realization of the new world order. In this connection, he identifies two simultaneous but independent and closely linked processes. The first process, dear friends, is the mission of the North American Baha'i community. 
The first process is associated with the mission of the North American Baha'i community that started with the revelation of the tablets of the divine plan, but was suspended for about 20 years while the North American Baha'i community developed the necessary administrative structure to undertake its tasks. The administration evolved through two consecutive seven-year plans until 1953. The development of the North American Baha'i community continued during the 10-year crusade and will continue as a result of other systematic plans that will be devised and initiated by the Universal House of Justice. This evolution will be completed when the Baha'i World Commonwealth emerges in the golden age of the Baha'i dispensation. Dear friends, the second process, the role of the American nation. The second process is associated with the role that the American nation, though unaware of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, plays in the establishment of the new world order. This process commenced when the American nation turned its attention to world affairs with the outbreak of World War I. This engagement grew stronger when the president, Woodrow Wilson, gave a speech to the United States Congress on the 8th of January, 1918, outlining a statement of principle for peace known as the 14 points to guide the peace negotiations at the end of World War I. And here we see a picture, Germany asks peace on Wilson's 14 points. Formation of the League of Nations. In order to prevent another world war, American and British statesmen established the League of Nations. However, Woodrow Wilson did not manage to convince Americans to join the League of Nations. Although the United States continued to play an economically crucial role in advancing peace in Europe during the 1920s. And here, dear friends, we see the logo of the League of Nations and below is a picture of President Woodrow Wilson. And in a later section, we'll talk further about President Woodrow Wilson. The United States became more deeply involved in the affairs of the world with the outbreak of World War II. On the 14th of August, 1941, President Franklo, Franklin Roosevelt and the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill issued a joint policy statement known as the Atlantic Charter for a post-war world that was confirmed later by all the allies involved in World War II. And here with your friends, we see a picture of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill at the Atlantic Conference. Formation of the United Nations. The Atlantic Charter was incorporated by reference into the Declaration of the United Nations on the 1st of January, 1942, that was signed by 26 countries. This became the basis of the modern United Nations. The final charter of the United Nations was discussed and accepted at the United Nations Conference on international organization convened in San Francisco on the 25th of April, 1945. The San Francisco conference was attended by 50 countries from all parts of the world. The United Nations Charter was unanimously signed on the 26th of June and promulgated on the 24th of October, 1945. The cornerstone, dear friends, 
for the permanent seat of United Nations was laid in New York City in 1949. And here, dear friends, is actual signed copy of the Declaration of the United Nations. And here it says, dedication by the United Nations, pledging to employ its full resources, military or economic, in the struggle for victory over Hitlerism. The master in Sacramento. This is very interesting, dear friends. During his journeys in the United States, His Holiness Abdul Baha visited Sacramento, the capital of California, about 120 kilometers northeast of San Francisco. On the 26th of October, 1932, he gave a talk on international peace at the assembly hall of Hotel Sacramento. In that talk, he foretold the San Francisco conference by stating, inasmuch as the Californians seem peace loving and possessed of great worthiness and capacity, I hope that advocates of peace may daily increase among them until the whole population shall stand for that beneficent outcome. May the men of affairs in this democracy uphold the standard of international conciliation. Then may altruistic aims and thoughts radiate from this center toward all other regions of the earth. And may the glory of this accomplishment forever halo the history of this country. May the first flag of international peace be upraised in this state. May the first illumination of reality shine gloriously upon this soil. May this center and capital become distinguished in all degrees of accomplishment for the virtues of humanity and the possibilities of human advancement are boundless. And here, dear friends, are newspaper clippings of His Holiness Abdul Baha's visit and talking on the subject of world peace. And this talk, dear friends, was uh, recorded in the Promulgation of Universal Peace, pages 376 to 377. His Holiness Abdul Baha also designated, dear friends, New York City as the city of the covenant. In a talk Abdul Baha gave at a reception by the New York Peace Society on the 13th of May, 1912, he stated the powers of earth cannot withstand the privileges and bestowals which God has ordained for this great and glorious century. It is a need and exigency of the time Man can withstand anything except that which is divinely intended and indicated for the age and its requirements. Now, praise be to God in all countries of the world. Lovers of peace are to be found and these principles are being spread among mankind, especially in this country. Praise be to God. This thought is prevailing and souls are continually arising as defenders of the oneness of humanity, endeavoring to assist and establish international peace. There is no doubt that this wonderful democracy will be able to realize it and the banner of international agreement will be unfurled here to spread onward and outward among all the nations of the world. And dear friends, this is where the talk was held, Hotel Astor, Times Square, New York. America's spiritual destiny. The beloved guardian, Shore Fanu, refers to other significant foreign policies of the United States and its engagement in world affairs and then states that the journey of the American nation 
however long and tortuous the way, must lead through a series of victories and reverses to the political unification of the Eastern and Western hemispheres, to the emergence of a world government and the establishment of the lesser peace, as foretold by Baha'u'llah and foreshadowed by the prophet Isaiah, it must in the end culminate in the unfurling of the banner of the most great peace in the golden age of the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. And we find this, dear friends, in Citadel of Faith, page 33. And as we know, dear friends, tribulations are inevitable. Towards the end of the message, the beloved guardian Shorifani further elaborates on the journey that the American people will take towards its destiny. Many and diverse are the setbacks and reverses which this nation, extolled so highly by Abdul Baha and occupying at present so unique a position among its fellow nations, must alas, suffer. The road leading to its destiny is long, thorny, and tortuous. The impact of various forces upon the structure and polity of the nation will be tremendous. Tribulations on a scale unprecedented in its history and calculated to purge its institutions to purify the hearts of its people, to fuse its constituent elements, and to weld it into one entity with its sister nations in both hemispheres are inevitable. And we find this reference, dear friend, Citadel of Faith, page 33. The entire history of the revelation of His Holiness Baha'u'llah can be divided into three ages, or stages known as the heroic, formative, and golden ages. Each age on its own consists of a number of epochs or periods. This is a diagram of the different periods. You can see at the bottom, heroic age, formative age, golden age. The heroic age comprised of the period of the revelation of His Holiness the Baal, Baha'u'llah, as well as the ministry of His Holiness Abdul Baha. And the formative age restarted with the passing of His Holiness Abdul Baha. And we also read in Dispensation of Baha'u'llah, Dispensation of Baha'u'llah that it was more with the passing of Bahi Khanu, that the formative age from 1921 onwards and, uh, till the point of the Golden Age. The first stage is the heroic age, otherwise referred to by the beloved guardian Shabbat Fendi as the primitive age or the apostolic age. This stage began with the declaration of the Bab on the 23rd of May, 1844, and ended with the passing of Abdul Baha on the 28th of November, 1921, or more particularly, as the Guardian states, at the passing of the greatest holy leaf, the sister of Abdul Baha, in July, 1932. The primitive age of the Baha'i era unapproached in spiritual fecundity by any period associated with the mission of the founder of any previous dispensation was impregnated from its inception to its termination with the creative energies generated through the advent of two independent manifestations and the establishment of a covenant unique in the spiritual annals of mankind. Dear friends, this you can see the whole sun and this man standing 
with the whole power of the sun. And this is how this period of the heroic age was. The whole revelations of the blessed Bob, Baha'u'llah. The beloved guardian, Shulay Fendi, has identified three distinct epochs of nine, of 39, and of 29 years duration in the heroic age, which are associated respectively with the Babi dispensation and ministries of Baha'u'llah and of Abdul Baha. The formative age, dear friends. The transitional or formative age is the period of evolution of the faith towards the unfoldment of its potentials and the emergence of the world order envisaged by His Holiness Baha'u'llah. In the Baha'i writings, there is no indication of the duration of the formative age. However, dear friends, the beloved guardian Shola Fendi indicates that the formative age consists a number of epochs that will gradually emerge over time. In one of his letters, Shaul Fendi describes the major events to occur during the formative age. He foresees that during the succeeding epochs, the last and crowning stage in the erection of the framework of the administrative order of the faith of Baha'u'llah, namely the election of the Universal House of Justice, will have been completed. Also, the Kitab Ahtas, the mother book of his revelation, will have been codified and its laws promulgated. The lesser peace will have been established. The unity of mankind will have been achieved and its maturity attained. The plan conceived by Abdul Baha will have been executed. The emancipation of the faith from the fetters of religions, religious orthodoxy will have been effected and its independent religious status will have been universally recognized. And we find this in Citadel of Faith, page six. And we put it in a list form as for added emphasis, dear friends. Thus far, the Baha'i faith has passed through the following epochs of the formative age. The first epoch began with the ministry of the beloved guardian Shalai Fendi in 1921 and ended in 1944 to 46, the closing of the first century after the declaration of the Ba'ath. The second epoch began in 1946 and ended in 1963 with the election of the Universal House of Justice. This epoch extended the developments of the first epoch by calling for the consummation of a laboriously constructed administrative order and was to witness the formulation of a succession of teaching plans designed to facilitate the development of the faith beyond the confines of the Western Hemisphere and the continent of Europe. The second epoch, dear friends, thus clearly demonstrated the further maturation of the institutions of the administrative order. And here, dear friends, is a clipping stating the first historic House of Justice is elected. And it states, and this is uh, signed Hands of Faith. It says, on the occasion of worldwide celebrations, the, of the most great jubilee commemorating the centenary of the ascension of Baha'u'llah to the throne of his sovereignty with hearts overflowing with gratitude for his unfailing protection and overflowing bounties. We joyously announce to the friends of the East and West the election of the supreme legislative body ordained by him in his most holy book 
and promised by him to receive his infallible guidance, members of the first historic house of justice, duly elected by delegates comprising members of 56 national assemblies. And here are the names, dear friends, Charles Wolcott, Ali Nachjavani, H. Bora Kavalin, Ian Semple, Lutfula Hakim, David Hoffman, Hugh Chance, Amos Gibson, Hushman Fataiza. And this goes on, he says, to the jubilation of the entire Baha'i world for the victorious completion of the beloved guardian's unique crusade is now added the humble gratitude and profound thanksgiving of the followers of Baha'u'llah for the erection of the universal house of justice, that august body to whom all believers must turn, whose destiny is to guide the unfoldment of his embryonic world order through the administrative institutions prescribed by Baha'u'llah, elaborated by Abdul Baha, and laboriously erected by Shoghi Effendi, and to ensure the early dawn of the golden age of the faith when the, world, when the word of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Signed, Hans Faith, dated April 22nd, 1963. And here, dear friends, is a picture of the members of the Universal House of Justice in the Shrine Gardens of Mount Carmel. And you can see the members, Charles Wolcott, Amos Gibson, Hushman Patazan, Hugh Chance, H. Bora Kavalin, Ian Semple, Lord Fulah Hakim, David Hoffman, and Mr. Ali Nachchaban. The third epoch began in 1963 and ended in 1986. The period of the third epoch encompassed three world plans involving all national spiritual assemblies under the direction of the Universal House of Justice, namely the nine-year plan, 1964 to 1973, the five-year plan, 1974 to 1979, and the seven-year plan, 1979 to 1986. And dear friends, this third epoch witnessed the emergence of the faith from obscurity and the initiation of activities designed to foster the social and economic development of communities. The fourth epoch began in 1986 the Universal House of Justice announced the inception of this new epoch of the formative age in a letter dated 2nd of January, 1986 to the Baha'is of the world. The fourth epoch highlighted the significant developments that had occurred in the organic growth of the cause of God during the third epoch. In the previous epochs, the national plans were largely derived from the Baha'i World Center in the epoch, the specific goals for each national community were formulated within the framework of the overall objectives of the plan through consultation between national spiritual assemblies and the Continental Board of Counselors. And dear friends, the fifth epoch started in 2001. The Universal House of Justice announced the inception of this epoch of the form formative age in a letter dated 16th January 2001 to the Baha'is of the world as the construction projects on Mount Carmel approached their completion and as the internal processes of institutional consolidation and the external processes towards world unity became more fully synchronized. The extraordinary dynamics at work throughout the conference crystallized these indications into 
a recognizable reality. This was the gathering of the Conference of the Councillors. You see the, the picture here at the International Teaching Center. And the, these are the participants of that conference, 14th January 2001. Future epochs, dear friends. Additional epochs can be anticipated in the formative age as the tasks to be completed in this age are many and challenging. The will and testament of His Holiness Abdu'l-Bahá provides the link between the heroic age and the formative age. Lastly, the golden age of the Baha'i era. The golden age is the stage of perfection and the realization of the goals of the dispensation of His Holiness Baha'u'llah. The initial stages of the Golden Age will be synchronized with the emergence of a world community, the consciousness of world citizenship, and the founding of a world civilization and culture. The beloved guardian, Shogh Effendi, regards such developments as the furthermost limits in the organization of human society. Though man as an individual will nay must indeed as a result of such a consummation continue indefinitely to progress and develop. These dear friends are quotes from the World Order Baha'u'llah, page 163. And finally, dear friends, in the course of the Golden Age, Humanity will witness that the banner of the most great peace promised by its author will have been unfurled. The world Baha'i Commonwealth will have emerged in the plenitude of its power and splendor and the birth and efflorescence of a world civilization. The child of that peace will have conferred its inestimable blessings upon all mankind. Such outcomes will be unfolded through successive epochs of the Golden Age. And that, dear friends, was our last slide. Dear friends, we look forward to presenting our next section. Thank you. Wishing you a wonderful evening.